uh, uh, my plan is to give you a little introduction to um, spiders. Um, and then actually I'll, I'll read you two pieces about spiders. Uh, one about spider bites and another one about spider cognition. And the reason, I, the reason I'll read rather than just talk is because if, if I start talking, I'll wander off onto, you know, I might start talking about butterflies or something. So I'll, so I'll read instead, I think it'll be more informative. <clears throat> um, and just to start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop the, this image off for a second and put up a little video that I shot yesterday. And I'll just tell you quickly about it here. There we go. Okay, this second. And what they're doing on this park bench is ballooning. In other words, they're, they're running around, they're sending out strands of silk, and they're trying to um, uh, fly. They're trying to fly off on strands of silk, these little wolf spiders. It's just a, just a cool little thing. A, a lot of spider species do this, especially the young ones. And, it's kind of a, a way of spiders going off to seek their fortunes. And there you have it. So I'm gonna flip back now to the, to the slideshow. And let me just tell you a few, a few things about spiders. Here's a, here's a grass spider. Um, I think the, the basic thing to know about spiders is that they're not insects. Insects and spiders are two different things. So if you look at this, you look at this picture, you can see that this spider has two body parts. Um, it's got the cephalothorax or the head part and then the abdomen, the back part. Well, spiders have two body parts. Insects have three body parts. You go ahead and count the spider's legs. You see the spider's got eight legs. Um, insects have six legs. Um, and and another, another difference between spiders and insects is that um, spiders do not have wings, although those little wolf spiders are trying to fly, but they fly on silk. They don't, spiders don't have wings. They don't have a stinger and they don't have antennae, um, which, um, you know, a lot of insects have wings, a lot of insects have stingers, a lot of insects have antennae, but that's, that's generally how you can tell um, a spider from an insect. Um, <clears throat> another thing I call attention to on the spider, this, this grass spider, you can see his face very clearly and you can count his eight eyes there. Um, most, the vast majority of spiders have eight eyes. Some have six eyes, and there's a, there's there are some some families that have four eyes, and there are even there have been found cave spiders that have no eyes, but the vast majority of spiders have eight eyes, like this one, and they're they're arranged in different patterns. You can see the the pattern of a grass spider there. Um, I call this spider him. And how do I know it's him? It's by the, those two little hands on the side of his face, those two little like boxing glove items. Those are, those are his palps. And since they're quite swollen, um, that, that indicates it's a male. The, the, swell, the swollen endings of the the palps mean that his, his the palps are charged with sperm, and all he needs to do now is find a, a female that will will have him and to mate. Um, so those are called the palps, which I think I'm going to mention again at some point. And then underneath the eyes hanging down there, those two little lobes, those are the chelicera or the jaws, the spider's jaws. And you can't see them on in this picture, but there are little fangs at the end of the jaw. And we'll get a diagram of that a little later. Now there's, 
Um, there are kind of basically two kinds of spiders in general. There's um, uh, web spinning spiders that hunt by with web that get their prey by catching it in webs. Um, and then there are um, hunting spiders. Uh, this picture is a picture of a barn spider that I took in Unity. He's, this he, barn spiders are orb weavers. They, do, they spin those big spiral shaped webs um, that, that you see, uh, you know, and catch flies and mosquitoes and whatever else wanders in. Barn spiders are one of the biggest spiders we have around here. Um, so there's, there are the web weaving spiders and there are the hunting spiders like this, this wolf spider. This is a thin legged wolf spider, a female. And how, how do I know that? Because she's got her egg sac there that she carries around until the little spiderlings um, will hatch. And on wolf spiders, the spiderlings hatch and then they they scurry up onto their mother's back and they'll ride around on their mother's back for a week or two in some cases until they're ready to go and then they go off and seek their fortunes. This spider you see now is a nursery web spider. I took this picture on also on my, my deck and um, taking you back to the, the spider's face and the, the two little palps there. You can see that this spider's palps are not swollen on the end. Um, and that means this is a female, not a male. Um, this is a some kind of cobweb weaver spider. We couldn't figure out exactly what, even what genus it is, let alone species, but some kind of cobweb weaver that's that's um, caught an army worm, and you can see that the spiders tied the army worm up. That thick wad of silk there wrapped right around the army worm. Um, and this is all to, to indicate um, what spiders eat, and they'll eat just about anything they can catch, with you know, all kinds of bugs and worms, and they, in, in, most spiders' strategy, whether they're a hunter or, or a web weaver, is to um, bite the prey. Once they get it, to bite it and inject it with venom that paralyzes it. And so this this army worm has probably been bitten and paralyzed, and then now the spider's tying it up, and and it it'll it'll eat eat the army worm. I didn't see that happen. It was quite a long process. And then finally, just for another image, this is a, this is a um, arabesque orb weaver, which are pretty common in fields in Maine. They're um, kind of a medium sized spider. You can see that just calling attention to the, the different pattern of the eyes in this orb weaver. See how there's four eyes right in the front, and then there's there are four other eyes flanking. I, we might only be able to see two of them, but there are eight there at some point. And so that's a little introduction to who spiders are. And so next I'll go on to um, read a couple of. Um, things about the first one about spider bites. And it goes like this. One morning some years ago, I woke up with a bug bite on my side. It itched. I didn't think too much of it because insect bites are commonplace in the Maine woods in summer. Black flies in May, mosquitoes in June. Deer fly horse gnats and no seams. The picture you're seeing now is a house spider that's caught a deer fly. You can see the house spider's butt there behind in, in the legs up over. A lot of stuff that bite people. <clears throat> in fact, um, 
or because of our bug season, Thoreau scheduled his trips to Maine for late summer and fall just because biting bugs have subsided by then. Well, after a few days, this bite on my side did not go away. It itched painfully. It started to swell and discolor. More days passed and the ugly welt on my hip bone turned volcanic. One evening it hurt so much that I got up from my desk at work, went to the store and looked for some kind of bomb to put on it. It didn't help much. And just to flip the picture, this is a um, sheet web weaver that's caught a winged aphid. It's biting the aphid, that's the connection here. So after a week or so, I went to the doctor. Hmm, the doctor said, that is a necrotizing wound. Probably, he said, a brown recluse spider bit me. He recommended some kind of ointment, I forget what, and told me to come back if it wasn't healing within a week or two. Most, now, most everyone knows that brown recluse bites, along with black widow bites, can be dangerous, even deadly. Technically, this is true. But before the 1950s, few people in the continental United States were too concerned about or had even heard of brown recluse spiders. There were reports of spiders in Missouri in the 1920s and 30s, inflicting bites that resulted in fairly nasty skin lesions. So in the mid-1950s, some researchers decided to investigate. They noted a striking similarity between the symptoms of the bites in Missouri and the bites by the Chilean recluse spider, which is this spider here, that had been studied in the 1930s in South America. Eventually, the researchers concluded that the probable culprit in Missouri was the Chilean recluse spider's cousin, the brown recluse. And this is a picture of a brown recluse. The researchers report in the science in 1957 makes no mention of deaths resulting from recluse bites. Well, after the news media noticed the story, many reports of brown recluse bites began to surface. After a while, the fact that brown recluse spider bites can cause necrotic lesions spread from news reports into medical literature and doctor's offices. At some point, it was recognized that systemic loxosalism, as the severest result of a brown recluse bite is known technically, could in rare instances cause death. By the 1990s, physicians were often diagnosing necrotic lesions as brown recluse bites, even when no spider had been seen, which was usually. Since then, it's been hard for arachnologists and entomologists to disabuse people of the deadly spider bite fallacies. <clears throat> The most important thing to understand about spider bites is this. The vast majority of spiders do not bite human beings. Most spiders bite to subdue prey, not to deter predators. They deliver venom from glands connected to tiny fangs located on the tips of their jaws or chelicery. So this is a diagram that I, I stole from uh, Don Barry's booklet. Uh, up at Umaine. You can see the chelicera there and the, then on the right there's the, the chelicera are separated. You can see the fangs um, there. So that's, how, that's how our kinds of spiders bite. It's different than tarantulas, the way tarantulas um, are, are built, but this is how most spiders around here um, work. So in most spider species, those mouth parts, that, those fangs and those chelicera are not large or strong enough to break human skin. Of the more than 49,000 known spider species, 
only about 200 of them can inflict a medically significant bite to humans. Only four spider genera, of all the spiders there are, only four genera can inflict a bite that can result in death. In North America, two spiders that can deliver medically significant bites are the widow spiders and brown recluse spiders. The venom of widow spiders, which is a kind of cobweb weaver related to house spiders that we have abundantly here in Maine, uh, the venom of widow spiders contains a neurotoxin which acts on nerve tissue and is designed to paralyze prey. When a widow spider bites a human, symptoms of latrodectism, the, these widow spiders are, are in the genus latrodectus. So the, they call the symptoms latrodectism. And those symptoms include abdominal and facial muscle pain, nausea or tremors, and, and they, it, the symptoms may begin in a half hour to two hours. In the vast majority of cases of, of widow bites, any symptoms subside within a day or so. In rare cases, muscles in the chest and diaphragm can be affected, causing respiration problems. And in even rarer cases, when that happens, the, the, those problems can lead to heart attack or death. Uh, widow spider bites lead to death in less than 1% of the cases in which a human is bitten. And remember, humans are hardly ever bitten by these spiders. Now, the venom of brown recluse spiders, the, the recluse spiders are the genus Loxosceles. The venom of brown recluse spiders contains a cytotoxin, which damages cell tissue. A human is unlikely to even notice a bite from a recluse spider when it happens. In a day or two, as enzymes destroy flesh around the wound, a lesion may arise that can go from irritating to painful over a few days. Arachnologists refer to this as cutaneous loxosceles. Most brown recluse bites are either never noticed or subside within a few days. In unusual cases, the lesions can grow quite large, they can last months and require medical care. In rare cases, more severe reactions develop, including damage to red blood cells, disruption of blood clotting, and renal failure, which in very rare cases can lead to death. <clears throat> Accurate estimates of how many people are actually bitten each year by widow or recluse spiders are nearly impossible to come by, largely because in so many cases, no spider is ever seen, like in my case. A study by a medical doctor of animal-related fatalities in the U.S. from 1991 to 2001 found 66 people died from venomous spider bites in those 10 years, most of them in the South. But you have to wonder about this, since it's so often uncertain that a spider actually inflicted the wound. Arachnologists are more or less unified in asserting that doctors often misdiagnose as spider bites, lesions and infections that were actually caused by allergic reactions to bites by other arthropods, or even to, to skin irritants. Incidents of recluse spiders biting humans are not common to begin with, even in places where the spiders are abundant. One researcher counted more than 200 recluse webs in a house in the south where no one had ever been bitten. Well known to arachnologists is the fact that very few spiders defend themselves aggressively from large beasts like humans. Almost all spiders, and especially cobweb weavers such as widow spiders, almost always run away first and stand and fight only as a last cornered resort. A few spiders commonly found in the Northeast, in our area, 
do have the capacity to make you remember such an encounter, even though their bites are not medically significant. Some wolf spiders, and I found this uh, rabbit or rabbit dose on wolf spider, it was enormous. Uh, you can see it's next to, next to some notebooks. It was on my, my study floor. It won't bite you, believe it or not. But some wolf spiders, some jumping spiders, and some sack spiders, this is a sack spider that was on the kitchen sink, are said to be capable of making an impression on you, as well as grass spiders. And here's, a, here's another close-up of the male grass spider. The, the, the hobo spider, which is a grass spider that lives mainly in the Pacific Northwest, but has been seen in Maine a few times at least, has long been rumored to inflict painful bites. It's a rumor. Researchers have found little hard evidence that this is even true. The primary range of the brown recluse spider is the, is the deep south north to about the middle of Illinois, as you can see on this map. Since spiders and other wildlife have uh, are unconcerned with political boundaries, brown recluses are naturally found from time to time elsewhere, but hardly ever at latitudes as high as Maine's. Um, the last documented or studied case, at least, in Maine, in, was in the late 1980s, Maine's foremost spider expert, Daniel Jennings, investigated the discovery of a female Western black widow spider in Bangor. Uh, this spider, um, this, this picture you're seeing now is a picture a guy took and sent to me from Brunswick. And it's a, it's a black widow spider and it had fallen out of a crate that had come from Texas or somewhere like that. And pretty low be and it died there on his patio. Um, so they're here. Um, but anyway, uh, when Jennings, Jennings investigated the discovery of a female Western black widow spider, he determined the spider had stowed away in the belongings of a family that had recently driven to Maine from Arizona. He and his research partner, Ivan McDaniel, also investigated the discovery of a male and a female brown recluse in 1981 and concluded that pair as well had been brought accidentally to Maine, this time from Oklahoma. Only one black widow bite has ever been reported in Maine. And in that case, the spider is believed to have been misidentified. <clears throat> it's not impossible for brown recluse or widow spiders to set up breeding colonies in Maine under the right conditions, Jennings says. But the right conditions would be something like an attic whose winter temperature doesn't go much below 50 degrees which is, at least now is sort of an unheard of possibility. Um, and so the conditions are extremely unlikely at our latitudes. Re researchers study studying the cold tolerance of recluse spiders in Illinois concluded it's unlikely those spiders can become established north of their documented range in, in about mid-Illinois. Most spiders have strong enough jaws and potent enough venom to be dangerous to humans live in Australia and South America. The male funnel web spider in Australia might have venom most deadly to humans, though no deaths from its bite have been reported since 1981, around the time anti-venom therapies became very effective. <clears throat> so, this painful wound on my side was almost certainly not a spider bite. But having heard the same rumor as everyone else about brown recluse bites being potentially fatal, I nervously followed the doctor's advice. But the truth is, the severity of any arthropod bite, whether it's a 
spider, a bug, or tick, or whatever, depends in large part on the person's sensitivity to the toxin. Whatever got me, I was just simply allergic to. Within a week or so of my visit to the doctor, my swelling subsided. A faint mark remained for quite a while, reminding me of who we share the world with, like this house spider, who's a cousin of the widow spiders, and it was in my study. And by the way, there is most likely a spider within three feet of you right now. It is almost certainly not going to bother you. And it is going to eat things that want to eat you. So that's, if you can think of any questions springing from all that, feel free to chime in. Dana, if I could jump in really quickly. Sure. We had um, a couple of great questions. One, which I was wondering, if some spiders do not have eyes, how do they find the things that they need and how do they find a mate? That's a pretty interesting question. The, the spiders, there, there are hardly any, I, I probably shouldn't even have said there are spiders with no eyes because there's hardly any species that don't have any eyes. But at the same time, um, most spiders can't see that well. Some, some can see really well, but most can't see very well. And they, um, and they, they find their prey, whether it's with a web or hunting, and they find their mates um, by vibrations. Um, uh, in the web vibrations of silk, they're, they're, spiders seem to be as, as sensitive to vibrations of silk as our ears are to sound waves. They, they, um, they in a minute, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about how they, they, they communicate with, with vibrations. And, there are, and the mating rituals of many spiders include vibrations, include tapping and things like that. And they also can smell whatever that means to a spider, but they have, they have all factory capacities. So they, they make their way around, um, wh whether they're hunting or trying to find a mate or whatever they're doing, they, they go by, Vibrations mean as much to them visual imagery means to us. And, and that's how they do it. And they can smell each other um, and, and that kind of thing. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that was great. Well, uh, we have a couple more, but I'll hold on to them so you can read your next piece. Okay, I'll go on to um, the title of this turned out to be, what do spiders know and how do they know it? Um, and I think about this question a lot, probably more than is good for me. A few weeks back, I was watching some little wolf spiders, a pick one, darting around in a field in unity. And I wondered for the 10,000th time, what the spiders and trees and all the other creatures who wake up in spring are thinking when warmer air and brighter sunlight hits and they wake up. How do they know what to do? This is a wolf spider in springtime. You can call it instinct and let it go at that. But as Edgar Allan Poe himself said, the boundary between instinct and reason is of a very shadowy nature. It looks to me like spiders somehow think whatever that might mean. And it turns out there are arachnologists wondering the same kinds of things about spiders' cognition, what spiders know and don't know and how they know it. One research team dissected the brains of old spiders to find out if they showed signs of aging. They did. Uh, so here's a 
here's like a short list of studies that that have revealed some strange things over the last few decades of, of what spiders are are thinking if you can put that word on it. So point number one is spiders can learn. This is a Porsche fimbriata jumping spider. Well, they live in Australia and Southeast Asia. These spiders devise plans to capture prey on a case-by-case -case basis. They stealthily observe a target, such as another spider in its web, that's their specialty. And then they plan a route to a point of attack. Sometimes the route takes Portia out of visual or vibrational range, meaning she seems to have a representation in her mind of what she can no longer see. Spider, the prey, the spider stalks it, the, the, the Portia can't see the, the spider it's after anymore, but she's got a mental image of where she's going and what it looks like, a representation. Arachnologists Robert Jackson and Fiona Cross also observed that Portia learns through trial and error by drawing potential prey out of its web with vibrations, which are a common mode of spider communication. This is what, the, what Jackson and Cross say about that. When confronting large, powerful spiders and webs, Portia often derives signals by trial and error that elicit slow, approaching, hesitating steps. This being how the resident spider tends to behave when seeming to be uncertain about the source of the web signals it's receiving. Alternatively, Portia may move in slowly for the kill while making signals derived by trial and error that keep the victim calm and stationary. Calming effects might be achieved by monotonous repetition of a habituating signal as though Portia were putting its victim to sleep of a vibratory lullaby derived by trial and error. You know, and, and so another way of saying this is that the, the, the Porsche spider figures out by trial and error a little song that lulls the, the spider it's after, you know, to sleep, or at least, at least you know, it turns off its caution. It's kind of strange. In a different experiment, some engineers in Great Britain wanted to learn the mechanics of how jumping spiders jump. So they trained a regal jumping spider to leap between level, higher, and lower platforms and film the leaps. And I, I scraped one of their photos from their, their report. And this is, this is a, you know, a picture of the spider making the leap between platforms. A strange aspect of this experiment is that the researchers did not use bait to get ready to jump. Instead, their report states, the spider was manually transported between the takeoff and landing platforms until it became familiar with the challenge. No form of stimulation, e.g. air blowing, was used to induce a jump. The spider did not fail any of the jumps. It was either a jump or no jump situation. And you know, note the engineer's use of the word challenge. In other words, this spider took the, took the challenge that the, the engineer showed it and learned to make the jump. I, I find that fascinating. So that's one thing. Here's a, here's a second point. Spiders can remember. The bowl and doily spider, and this is a picture of, of one in a vial that I captured. The bowl, bowl and doily spider, which we have here in Maine, in experiments was allowed to catch prey. Then the prey would be taken away. Most of the spiders would then search for the lost prey, sometimes for as long as 40 minutes. And they searched longer for larger prey. They also distinguished between the particular item they were looking for and older remnants. 
the, and the upshot of that is they remember, as the zoo warden in Jurassic Park said about the dinosaurs. Point three, spiders can count. The golden silk orb weaver, which lives in the tropics and subtropics, also searched for missing prey in experiments. And the researchers found that more prey were missing, the more the spiders searched. This implies the spiders keep track of the number of prey in their larders. They can count. In another experiment, researchers observed young Portia Africana jumping spiders. Oh, oops, sorry, that's the golden silk orb weaver. There. Just leave that on for a second so you can see it. They, they're called golden silk orb weavers because they spin gold colored silk, very bright gold colored silk. So kind of amazing. So this is a this is a Porsche Africana jumping spider. And the researchers discovered that when the, the young spiders would decide where to settle, settle down to, to hunt um, flat mesh weavers. Um, they'd, they'd settle down near the web of flat mesh weavers. Um, and it turned out that that the jumping spiders clearly prefer to settle, settle down to their hunt where there was one other young jumping spider already settled. They were significantly less likely to settle where there was no other jumper or where there were two or three already. It had nothing to do with available space. The spiders counted each other. So that's weird. And then no, point number four, spiders communicate. It is well established that spiders communicate. This has been known for quite a long time. Some spiders with very good vision, notably jumping spiders, communicate in mating rituals with displays of male body colors and what amounts to dancing. Some of these spiders also produce sounds through stridulations of the legs and through tapping more or less rhythmically of the legs or abdomen. You can see, you can find a lot of YouTube videos of dancing, jumping spiders. It's pretty amazing. Communication through vibrations, especially in silk, is more or less universal among spiders. In some cases, at least, the meaning can be quite specific. Among cellar spiders, and this is a female cellar spider carrying around her, her, her egg, egg sac. Um, I took this picture over in Stu Ben. Uh, among cellar spiders, a mated male and female may cohabit a web for some time. And when one returns to the web after venturing out, he or she will send vibrations through the silk of the web that means basically, it's me, don't eat me. They communicate very specifically with each other. And the, the fifth point is um, about some spiders at least seem to have personalities. Most spiders live solitary lives, but a few hundred species live in colonies. They're called social spiders. Studies of the African velvet spider, and that's, this is a picture of some African velvet spiders in their colony, have shown that the longer a given individual spider lived with and had social interactions with other spiders, the bolder those individuals tended to be disruptions to the colony. In another study of a different species of velvet spider, um, individuals showed greater shyness after disruptions. So the, so the exact opposite among individuals in this other uh, related species. In both cases, the researchers concluded there were individuals with, well, this is by the, this, 
Sparta scientists more pronounced personalities, unquote. Another study of the jumping spider Marpissa muscosa, this is a, a classic jumping spider image, um, found that individuals raised in environments enriched with physical enhancements, such as bark, moss, and leaves, grew up to be more exploratory than individuals raised in bare environments. Researchers wrote, external stimuli can influence the development of one aspect of personality in a young spot. So, I mean, when you think about that sentence, it can, depending on what you think about spiders, it can kind of give you a chill because not only are they, do these researchers think the jumping spiders have individual personalities, they have complex personalities with aspects. So the spiders are starting to seem like little little um, people in monster bodies. And then fi a final point is that you, it gets to the point where you start to wonder if spiders have some kind of aesthetic sensibility. Some spider species like the garden spiders uh, we have abundantly in Maine spin a squiggle of heavy silk called a stabilimentum into the center of their orb webs. And you can see in this picture, there's the, there's the spider. You can't see the spiral web very well in this picture, but you can see the stabilimentum um, through the middle. They all do it. Uh, no, one knows, no one knows for sure what the stabilimentum does. There are a lot of different theories, of course, but but none of them is conclusive. And what I find interesting is that Iraq, arachnologists routinely refer to this stabilimentum as a decoration. That's the word they use, as if the spiders are making art. No one knows if this could possibly be true. Um, trash line spiders, and here's one I took a picture of on my deck. Um, also decorate their webs with bits of dead vegetation and insect body sparks. Uh, one species found in Japan arranges the, the detritus like this to resemble its own size and shape. And presumably this is, you know, as a decoy, although the, the studies don't, the studies are inconclusive about whether it's a decoy or not. A few years ago, researchers found trash line spiders in the Peruvian Amazon and in the Philippines that construct lifelike effigies of themselves. And this is the Philippine picture. I couldn't find a, a usable picture of the, the Peruvian Amazon um, effigy, but the, but the ones I saw were, re, you know, look remarkably like the spider. The spider itself is building these effigies of itself and then hiding underneath it. Um, and then, and so there's that. And then there's the curious fact that um, spiders tripping on small doses of LSD engineer more perfect webs than spiders who are straight. That's a pretty strange one. A regular backyard naturalist correspondent with a background in biological science wrote to me a while back to say he was skeptical of the idea that spiders have personalities. But how all these, all the above, and of course there's a lot more in the spider cognition literature, how all this could happen through instinct alone in bio-automatons seems to evade conventional scientific logic, as the arachnologists who study this suggest. Charles H. Turner, who was um, actually, he was a black guy who was pretty, uh, one of, one of the, the founders of, of modern arachnology, he, in 1892 um, said, he, he wrote, 
we may safely conclude that an instinctive impulse prompts gallery spiders to weave gallery webs, but the details of the construction are the products of intelligent action. Spiders have minds somehow. So, and that's how we get to end of all this. And this is the book. If, you, if after all this, you would like to get a copy of my book, which would really be great. You can get it online or you can get it from northcountrypress.com. And if you ask her, she'll send you a signed copy. No extra charge. Thank you so much, Dana. That was great. Mm -hmm. We've got a whole slew of questions here. Okay. Um, I'll start the one that I'm curious. Do you have a favorite spider or group of spiders? Do I have a favorite? I, I would have to say it's like people, when I used to teach um, literature classes, students would ask me that question and I would, and I would say, well, you mean who's my favorite this week? And it's kind of the same thing, but this year it's probably the nursery web spiders. And the reason why is because we found we found six or eight different nursery webs full of little nursery web spiders in the tiger lilies this summer, and it was great. So I'll say nursery web spiders. Great choice. Great choice. Um, let me look at our questions here. Um, here's a question. Uh, do you know why do spiders have eight eyes? Why do they? Okay. Um, well, lots of arthropods have, you know, a have a lot of eyes. The, the probably best I'm not sure if anyone knows why, but they can tell you what the eyes are used for, right? So in a, in a, um, a spiders with good vision, which are almost always hunting spiders, like wolf spiders or and jumping spiders, they're, they're, the wolf spiders have four fairly large eyes that see pretty well um, to the front. And jumping spiders, like this one, have two big eyes, make them look really cute. But they also, they're to the front, and they, their vision is almost as good as ours at short distances. So they've got, so these hunting spiders have got, you know, good eyes to see in front of them, but they don't, their, head, their heads don't swivel around or anything. So there's eyes on the sides and back of their, um, cephalothorax that are picking up other kinds of light. The, the, in, the, in the secondary eyes, um, like you can see the smaller eyes on the side of this um, jumping spider's face, the, 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 the light, what that, those eyes are picking up is not distinct images like the two front eyes are, but different incidences of light and motion. And then in the back of the the jumping spiders had, we, I don't have an image ready to show, but there are like little flecks that are eyes. And those ones are not showing sharp images at all. They're just, they're just like motion detectors. So they have a, they'll have a lot of eyes that are doing different things is the sort of general answer to the question. That's great. Thank you. Um, Here's a question. Do spiders eat ticks and do spiders eat spiders of their own species? Um, spiders do eat ticks. Most, most spiders um, eat anything they can, they can corral, which are, is stuff that's smaller than them or their own size and sometimes bigger like there are like there are fishing spiders that have been known to drag little minnows out of the water and, and eat them. So they do, yeah, they eat ticks, but they eat every, most, some spiders specialize in things, but most spiders are generalists who eat anything, including ticks. 
And uh, what was the second half of that question? Sorry, I'm getting old. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, will spiders uh, eat uh, spiders of their own species? Oh. Will they eat each other? Okay, yeah. Uh, not usually for food. They do eat some, a good many spiders eat other spiders, but um, not usually for food. But there is this, there is this thing of sexual cannibalism where the female will eat the male. And that happens um, that kind of, it happens in a lot of spider species, but not very much. Like you, like I saw a stupid headline on a, a science um, daily story today that said something about black widow spiders eat the, the male before the copulation is finished. Well, you know, okay, that, that does happen sometimes, right? But but hardly ever. The the fact is that in the general run of spider cannibalism, where the female eats the male, happens usually four or five percent of the time in most species. But I mean that's not all. But you know, among fishing spiders, the female eats the male pretty much every time. <laughs> in 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 the observations. So that's the answer to that. Excellent. Um, here's one. How do spiders know how uh, to make a web when they're born? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I right? like to, um, Professor Turner said in the, in the quotation at the end of the other thing, you know, a gallery spider, whatever, I don't know what a gallery spider is, but a gallery spider knows how to spin a gallery web, but when it, when it actually constructs the web, it's a thoughtful process. So it kind of, it's kind of like, you know, it's the same question as how does, why does the cat know to use the litter box? You know, that's, that's just what they do. You know, they come in, they come into it with whatever we come into the world with, they've got their program and their program that they come with um, to, uh, is the basic framework of how to put together the kind of web that that spider builds. And that's, it's interesting because all spiders who build webs, they each have their, you know, each one has their own way of doing it, has their own kind of web that somebody who would practice eye for webs can go out and say, oh yeah, that's a that's a um, garden spider web or oh yeah, that's a that's a long jar orb weaver's web. Yeah, I don't I, I think probably the answer is no one knows the answer to that. <laughs> it's a we haven't researched it yet. <laughs> well I think maybe they have but gone as far as they can which isn't very far because how do you know it's in you know the the easiest answer is it's, it's genetically programmed but what does that mean <laughs> you know absolutely um just as a, a note for the time it is 701 if folks need to drop off we understand but dana very kindly has offered to stick around for another five to ten minutes to answer some more questions i can sure. see that they're they're still coming in which is fantastic we had an interesting question that was um submitted uh during registration and dana i don't know if you can talk at all about uh the status of the balance between um, spiders and native and beneficial insects, um, considering that the world's uh, biodiversity um, of insects is is decreasing. Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. In the spider um, seminar week long thing I went to a, a couple of years ago, that came up in the in the um, the gen the answer to that in general is that is it, Climate change is really doing a number on, you know, a lot of ecosystems, but spiders are really, really well set up to, to weather this whole thing because they, most of them um, visualize in anything. So if in, their, if in their habitat or their ecosystem they live in, 
something, you know, something gets wiped out. Like it looks to me like the dragonflies in my area at least are are getting wiped out for some reason. But but they'll maybe there would be a spider that would like to have dragonflies, for example. I'm just making that up hypothetically. But if the dragonflies disappear, then it'll then it just goes for something else. So spiders are really, really, you know, well well positioned to weather this whole storm. And, and there, although there are endangered spiders on some lists in the world, um, that there are. It seems like you don't quote me on this, but it seems to me like there are, there are a lot fewer threatened spiders than there are a lot of other creatures. And that's because they're, they're generalists and, and eat everything and have and they and a lot of them have different ways of catching things too. Great. Um, here's more of a um, a spider mechanics question. Um, why are spiders able to climb up walls when we see them scurrying up the sides uh, of our bedroom walls here? How can they do that? Yeah, yeah they. I think they have a. But their feet are tacky. It's like other bugs. And they have little, most of them have little claws. Sometimes they have two claws or three claws out there on the, their feet. In fact, this picture that's up now, that down in the lower right, you can see claw, the spider's claws there. So they can grip. I think it's because their feet are tacky, like other bugs. Um, some, we had quite a few, uh, questions about, um, spiders in people's homes and, um, is there, do you know of any way to either, what's like the safest way to remove a spider? I know a lot of folks find spiders in their homes and they'd rather have them live outside. So yeah. what's a good way to safely remove a spider so you don't stress it out too much by putting it out? And is there any way to deter spiders from maybe coming in your house? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think there's any way to deter spiders from coming in than there is to deter ants. You know, I would love to get rid of the ant, but um, I don't, uh, they're, they're, it's some, some spiders just like to live around people, you know, they, and so they're gonna come in, but to, to get, don't kill them, please don't kill the spider because they're actually your friends even though they look like monsters. And the way I get rid of bugs, I don't want to, actually, I have to take spiders out of my house because my wife doesn't like them. So when I find one in the, like in the kitchen counter or something, I get a slip of paper and I herd it onto the slip of paper. Um, and then I take it to the door and you know, put it on the porch railing. That's what I do. Or you could get some vials and catch them in a vial and take them outside and let them go. Uh, I'd really rather you didn't kill them. Absolutely. I, don't, I don't have much. I don't have much more on that. I, I, I can tell you that um, if you if you spray insecticide around, you're killing everything. You're not. You know, the, your your um your can might say, you know, wasp killer or spider killer, but it's killing everything. It's not just killing spiders or anything like that. My, and I know that because my brother is a, um, you know, a bug killer professional. <laughs> so I mean, you could spray, but I would ask him not to. Okay. Um, uh, for the juveniles, juvenile spiders that are riding on uh, the back of the, the wolf spiders, on the back of the wolf spider mom, um, what do they, what do they eat? Is the uh, mom spider finding them food? Are they finding food by themselves? I tried to find that out once and I couldn't, in the search I made, I couldn't find out definitively. I, but I think, I think maybe the, the mother is um, uh, 
feeding, you know, finding food and then feeding, find, regurgitating it or something. But I'm not sure of that. Don't quote me on that. But I could, I did, I did try to find that out once, and I couldn't. I know it's got to be out there. I just didn't find it. For further investigation, I think we yeah. have time for for one more question, okay. and. Um, this one I thought was kind of interesting. So is there a relationship between spiders and uh, any native plants? And are there any native plants that are good for spiders? So making, you know, good spider habitat, uh, perhaps in our gardens. Um, well, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I can't, I can't answer that specifically, but I can tell you that Spiders, um, uh, web building spiders have preferred places to build their webs. And some are, a lot of them are in brush, but some are in trees and at different levels. Like when you, when you walk through the woods and you get hit in the face with, you know, a silk that's across, hanging across, that, that usually was put there by either a trash line spider or a Nordmani orb weaver, which is like a garden, a kind of garden spider, because that's the that's the level they they like that they live at. Um, but then there'll be there's others that are up higher in the trees that you never see, and there are others there are ground spiders that stay, you know, that are in the grass. So I don't know that <clears throat> it it may be that you you could find out you know, ways to foster your spider population by planting the right spiders, but I don't, uh, I'd be, I'd be skeptical of, of that because I, you know, they're, they're, again, they're generalists and they, they live in a lot of places. Even one species will live in a lot of different places. Excellent. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Thank you to everybody who joined us this evening. Thank you so much, Dana, for sharing your wonderful imagery and you. um, your different writings. Um, to let everyone know, I will be uh, sending out the recording of this lecture to everybody, um, most likely tomorrow. And um, yeah, have a wonderful evening.